Uh, so welcome to the Bibliographic Society of Australia and New Zealand's latest occasional webinar, Collecting and Curating. Today, our Society President, Simon Farley, Librarian of the Friar Library at the University of Queensland, is talking with Maggie Payton, Head of Collection Acquisition and Curation at the State Library of New South Wales and Vizan's Consular, uh, Dawn Albinger, President of the Australian and New Zealand Association of Antiquarian Booksellers and Co-Proprietor of Archives Fine Books in Brisbane, and Chris Brown, Professor Emeritus at Monash University, Program Director of Melbourne Rare Book Week. I'm Marie Larson and I'm a member of the Society's Engagement Committee. I also have with me today fellow Engagement Committee member Fiona McConnell, who will be helping to monitor the chat and share any links that may come up during the panel. I would like to acknowledge that I live and work on Ghana Mayana land. The dreaming is still living from the past into the present, into the future forever. Some quick housekeeping. Uh, we do request you keep yourselves muted during today's session. The session is being recorded, so you're welcome to keep your camera off should you prefer not to be featured in the recording. Please use the chat function to introduce yourselves and your interest in the topic of today's discussion. There will be some time for some questions at the end, so feel free to pop them in the chat as we go and we'll get to as many as we can. Uh, and with all that said, I'll now be passing over to Simon to introduce our panelists for today. Thank you, Simon. Thank you very much, uh, Marie, and uh, welcome everyone to this occasional BSAT uh, webinar. Uh, I'd also like to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands here in Brisbane, where the University of Queensland is situated, the Turrbal and the Yagara people and uh, pay my respects to their elders and traditional owners and elders across Australia uh, from the places you're tuning in uh, from today. So hot on the heels of Melbourne Book Week last week, which sadly I could not make it to, I'm delighted to be joined by our panellists today to discuss a topic that's very dear to my heart, that perennially interesting topic of books and book collecting. And I'm joined by Maggie Patton, Head of Collection Acquisition and Curation at the State Library of New South Wales. Uh, and also the Bibliographical Society of Australia and New Zealand's Council Rep for New South Wales. Dawn Albinger, um, fellow Brisbaneite, uh, President of the Australian and New Zealand Association of Rare Booksellers, Antiquarian Booksellers, and co-proprietor of Archives Fine Books. And Chris Brown, uh, book collector, Professor Emeritus of Medical History at Monash University, and Program Director of Melbourne um, Book Week, Rare Book Week. So welcome to you all. It's wonderful to be joined uh, by you this, this afternoon. And I'd like to begin by asking a question um, about you uh, and your personal love of books. Did uh, books and book collecting start at an early age? Where did this uh, passion for you begin? And I open up to any one of you to start. Perhaps Chris. Okay, well, at, at a very early age for me, um, I, I would say what we used to call in England, I was born in Britain, uh, in England, and I was an Air Force brat, which both my parents were serving members of the Royal Air Force. And so they promptly flew away and left me with grandma when I was three years old. And grandma, bless her heart, taught me to read and taught me to love books. And she read from me uh, by actually my most valuable book. I don't know if you can see if I hold it up in front of me here. This is my personally most valuable book. It is the first edition of Kipling's Just So Stories, but she taught me to read by reading this to me. And it's that, that magic occurs where you read it, you look at it, you read it, you look at it, you read it, you listen, and all of a sudden, I can read it too. It's a magical process which I still don't understand. And she did exactly the same thing about 30 years earlier with my mother. I just taught her to read using exactly this book. And I, in turn, read this to my daughter. So this is the most precious book that I own. How she got a first edition of this, I have no idea. Uh, 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 but it remains a very precious book to me. So reading started my book collecting. Uh, and I've always been a passionate reader. And I've always then moved that onto collecting things which I like to read. And that's been the start of it. I should perhaps quickly add, the, I, I discovered much later that I have a heritage on the other side of my family. I knew my father had been trained as a printer publisher because his father had been a journalist printer publisher who owned his own firm that eventually was, like many in the UK, was a victim to paper rationing in 1940 as the realities of World War II were kicking in. And so I had that, I suppose, in my blood 
And I was always interested in hearing my, hearing my father talk about it, although he mostly talked about how much he hated working for his father. Uh, and so he, he didn't have a great love for the notion of printing and publishing, but it, it kindled, I think, an interest in me so that my interest in collecting books comes from both that love of reading and that interest in, in printing and publishing. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. What about you, Dawn? How did it start for you? Well, similarly, I had parents who read, not grandparents, well, also grandparents, but parents who read to me a lot. And I had the similar, similar magical experience of um, words suddenly, suddenly discovering that I was reading myself um, at a young age. I grabbed off from my bookshelf um, this book from my, also from my grandmother. This was my grandmother's copy of Jane Eyre. And Jane Eyre, I, I didn't even know that she had it or loved it until after she passed away and this came into my hands. Um, but it was a book that I read several times as a teenager and as a young adult. Um, uh, it really caught my imagination. I used to, I grew up with um, several rowdy siblings younger than me. So I used to climb trees with a favourite book to read and to find some solitude and peace. And so I too started as a reader. That was that was my way in. Books were a portal to a bigger, wider world. Well, well, my, my, don't, my parents weren't big readers, although I do remember my mother reading Cat in the Hat to me and I was devastated a few years ago when I realised that my brother had thrown out the reel-to-reel -reel recording of my mother reading the Cat in the Hat, but that's another thing. But I do have, and I'm sorry I didn't bring the prop today, I actually have a copy of Mary Poppins with a date juice slip in it. So when I was about eight, I actually put date to slips and call numbers in the backs of my books. So perhaps not a book collector, but a manager of book collections was there from the very beginning, <laughs> which is quite a sad tale. But Chris, talking about your grandmother getting that first edition, the library here, we have a collection called the Model School Library, and it was set up in the late 30s, early 40s for school librarians. And they came in and they had a look at the perfect sort of books to have in a school library. And we told them how to buy them and where to buy them and how much to pay and how to catalogue them. And in that collection is The Hobbit, 1939, because they purchased it for the book collection before it was even important. Just luck. <laughs> Just uh, imagine Mary Poppins, she, the author, lived up in Maryborough in mm. Queensland. And we had a, a tour group of tourists who go around looking at literary places and they stopped in the Fry Library but were on their way up to uh, Maryborough to see the house where, where she, where Travis lived. Mm. Yeah, wonderful. Um, Maggie, uh, I'm still, uh, I still have wonderful memories of the Bizance Conference in Sydney uh, in 2022, and you, you took us and your colleagues on a beautiful tour of the stacks uh, to see some of those extraordinary collections that are in the Mitchell Library, and of course one of the great libraries of Australia and the world. And I think of things like Shakespeare's First Folio or Blau's Grand Atlas, I suppose. I don't know what the figure of the value of your collections is. I, I just say it's a, probably a King's Ransom. Um, but I guess I wanted to ask the question, why is it important that libraries like the State Library of New South Wales, state libraries, national libraries, um, acquire these kinds of collections, which are really cultural assets for the whole community? Um, and the question is, why is it important that an institution like the State Library of New South Wales does that for the community? I think it's what you're saying there. It's about the community. It's about providing free access to important works for study, for research, for inspiration, for future designers, for future writers. And it's really as a community resource to be able to provide that for free. But it's also, I think, that historic role of libraries as keepers of knowledge of the history of the book, of the history of printing and having a safe place that for that to be. And we have the resources, we have the skills to have them stored appropriately to be preserved. And I think that's really important, that role. And if you think about war, um, disasters, floods, 
fire and all of that sort of thing to have that knowledge stored safely and securely for the long term and to be built upon for people to access is really important. That I remains wonder, the same. I wonder if uh, Dawn and Chris, have you had any thoughts on the importance of institutions like uh, State Library of New South Wales and State Library of Victoria and others uh, collecting books for the community? Uh, well, if I can say something about, uh, as a collector, um, reference collections uh, are very important to me to compare things which I have or I'm thinking of acquiring with well-described, well-researched copies that can help uh, establish uh, what, what a particular book is. A number of years ago, there was a very strange man lived in Fitzroy who put together an incredible collection of Australian children's books he was one of these uh, completely obsessive guys. When he eventually died, they tried to walk into his house. And the whole corridor was blocked up with books, piles of books. Uh, but it turns out eventually that he had left this collection to the State Library. Uh, and after some reluctance, when they actually examined it, they were completely blown away by what he collected. So he he was he took an interest in in uh, the Turners, for instance. So not only did he have a complete set of all the titles, he had a complete set of every edition. It was in absolutely incredible. And they're all in a lovely arrangement. They were well curated by the then uh, li uh, Children's Librarian of the State Library of Victoria. And so it was wonderful to go and visit that collection with my copy, undated, uh, and to go and compare it with what they held in there. And it's a, as a book collector, having access to that type of special collection is completely invaluable. I, I know of no other place uh, that holds all of those different editions of Ethel Turner and, and, and her sister. Uh, uh, and there are many, many other examples like it. So just as a reference collection, it's wonderful. I know that you, you're the librarian at Sydney University, used to be at the University of Bristol, because he used to be at Melbourne. He, when at, Br at Bristol, he was the custodian of the Penguin reference collection. Uh, Alan Lane, uh, as uh, a state, gave his collection of penguins to the University of Bristol. So if you want to go and check out what a penguin should look like, they've got them all, and they've been... I have visited, they are very well curated. And so that it's very important from a book collector's perspective that the big institutional collectors have not only the books, but they've curated them and described them properly and can locate them. Yes, we can always locate them. We've got a penguin collection too, but that doesn't sound as well curated as that one. Well, this was the literally Alan Lane's personal collection, which he, um, mm. and there are great stories about that. Uh, they're virtually all signed. Because he would he would insist that authors the Penguin publisher would sign the books, but sometimes they wouldn't. So he would write them a letter complaining that they hadn't signed the book, hoping they'd send one back. Because he'd cut the signature out and stick it in the copy of the book Penguin he had. Uh, and he famously yeah. also asked his his secretary to get him a few signatures for books that didn't have signatures, and she had to quietly point out to him that a bit difficult because these authors were now deceased. <laughs> Just going to say, it reminds me of the Muir collection at the State Library of Victoria uh, of Australian literary works that Muir had people, the writers signed. So it's an amazing collection of signed uh, signed books. Uh, Dawn, your thoughts? Well, I it's it's I come at it from uh, a couple of directions. Also, like Chris, as a book dealer, I'm I'm using libraries and public institutions as research resources for when I am looking at um, copies of books that I'm trying to. Um, describe properly myself. And um, and I often uh, am traipsing over the bridge to the John Oxley Library to ch check something that I might have against one of their either copies or a bibliographic reference they might have that I don't yet have. Um, so that's that's been, you know, a really important thing for me. I, I think also, you know, institutions, um, uh, one of my joys is, you know, finding something to that an institution would like to place in its collection. And so, you know, developing that relationship with institutions and helping them grow things that they're focusing on, great collections that mm -hmm. they're, you know, uh, focusing on. And thirdly, I would say on that point too, that it's been, I've also had the experience of returning something to an institution 
that they didn't know was gone. And uh, Maggie yes. might be familiar with the story of a book turning up or being offered to us for sale that had yes. Public Library of Sydney stamps on it. And when we checked and did our due diligence, mm -hmm. um, it was discovered that it had gone missing from the library at some point, um, uh, you know, could it could have been for for innocuous reasons or nefarious reasons? No one knows, and I I don't intend to cast any aspersions, but um, on on anyone who may have uh, come into contact with that book before me. But it was great to be able to to see it go home and 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 go back to its rightful place. I know that it's sometimes terrible that we stamp everything so numerously, but see how important it was. It was, it was. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. in fact, I might just do a little plug for the International League of Antiquarian Booksellers here because they have developed uh, a missing books register. Mm -hmm. So if, if an institution is aware that they've lost a book or misplaced a book, um, or heaven forfend, a book has been stolen. It can be registered there, and um, and then and then book dealers worldwide can can be alert are regularly alerted to things that have gone missing from collections. And to you know, if it's offered, then we we um, you know will let iLab know, and they will let the institution know or the relevant authorities. And there was an instance this earlier this year that some books which had been stolen from libraries in Northern Europe. Um, and the, they had actually been stolen. Were the, the thieves were caught and the books returned earlier this year. So, and so yeah, which we, we like to work together with um, with the institutions mm. when we can. <laughs> it reminds me, I, I did return um, a copy of Roland Barthes Empire of the Science back to the state to the university library about ten years after uh, after taking it out. I'd forgotten I'd had it, and it turned out in a box in my parents' place, and I surreptitiously put it back in the return. Slot, I didn't hear from them, so I have their so <laughs> stacks here somewhere. Um, just so thinking, that happens. <laughs> thinking about uh, book theft, um, uh, but it, it connects to the, the precious nature of, of books. Uh, Maggie, I mentioned uh, the first volume of Shakespeare, as precious things that you have. I mean, we, we feel fortunate just to have a facsimile copy, uh, the Sydney League facsimile uh, copy based on Duke of Devonshire's copy that, that was uh, reproduced a number of times. But to have the original, and there's other rare books, places a great onus on you mm. to protect those and look after them. Uh, so the question is around how you provide access to these beautiful books that you have. Is it usually only behind glass that that's a, that's a, a possibility? No, I, no, certainly if you have a legitimate to, reason to look at anything in our collection you just need to roll up to the special collections desk um, get a special collections card some things you know like the first folio you might need to have a good reason because we do need to rest these things they went out they were out for a year last year so we need to put them to bed for a little while but generally if people have reasons to see things they can have a look at them in the flesh but we have a lot of events that aren't just exhibitions behind glass so a couple of weeks ago, we had a big public viewing of all of our beautiful big bird books, and they were just out there around on the tables. We had curators turning pages, and people were just seeing them, them just there straight in front of them. We do lots of displays, so we try and promote the collections a lot, and it's quite exhausting, but if ever there's an event here, so during Writers' Festival, Sydney Writers' Festival, we had quite a lot of events. We'd have first editions. We'd have drafts of books. So we try and get them out as often as possible so people can see the real thing because the collections aren't for us just to put in a cupboard and to lock away. They are to be seen and to be used and to be looked at. Very important. I, I, um, everyone's telling me about how wonderful the Shakespeare exhibition you had uh, mm. last year was. Um, I know that when we do our object-based learning classes incorporating our rare books, the students here at UQ find that uh, wonderful and they're a bit they're a bit scared to even uh, yeah. go near them because they're such uh, precious things. But there is something, isn't there? We, even things like um, having the original bulletin newspapers mm. out and say students are studying Henry Lawson's The Drover's Wife yes. and they can see yeah. the first instance it was published in, in the serial bulletin or first rare edition yeah. um there's a certain thrill because even academics and most of us we will cut through the shortest path to find access to something so we look at a digitized version mm. when you have the original thing in front of you 
Uh, I was, it, yeah. it's, it's beautiful, isn't it? Wonderful. I was showing the first um, edition of the Sydney Gazette, the first newspaper in Australia the other day, and it was to a group of people from the Treasury. You know, and it's amazing how something like that actually is inspiring to them, which has got nothing to do with their daily life. And you know what I love in the first folio is when you don't flick the pages, but the sound of the page turning. That's mm. There's nothing like that mm. at all. Mm. It's very similar, Dawn, in, in archives, bookshop, when you have people looking through the stacks and looking through the pages of books, that uh, it's a sense of physicality, isn't it? Absolutely. I think um, that's something that doesn't date. People love the, the physical materiality of the books. Um, we often get asked, what's the oldest book in your shop? Um, a lot of people come just to buy regular reading copies of things, but um, when people ask to look at things that we might have displayed behind glass, we're very happy to bring them out and give them that experience of touching it, smelling it, um, <laughs> which is something that uh, people are delighted by when they walk into the shop, in fact, that's the first thing, first comment that most people make is this is is the mm -hmm. scent, the scent of that old leather, old paper, um, you know, maybe a little bit of dust. <laughs> but we try and keep it as spotless as we can. But um, yes, yes, it's I think the material nature of books uh is very appealing to people. And I mean, you know, certainly some people collect simply because things are beautiful to mm -hmm. to, to see and to hold, as well as to read. Just uh, giving me a Christian moment where I remembered the smell when I worked at archives many years ago. <laughs> you know, whole, whole room full of that beautiful, beautiful smell of old books. Mm. I I can remember a, a a book dealer in Oxford when I first started collecting books. Rather surprised me as he would open books up and he would inhale from them. Mm. And uh, I asked him what he was doing, why he was doing. It. He said, "Well, there are two reasons the dealer will do this. Firstly," I want to see if the pages have been cleaned. And if somebody has done that using hypochlorite, it's very hard to get rid of the last vestiges of the smell, and therefore I'll smell it. And so therefore I know the book has had some attention that maybe it shouldn't have. And secondly, he said, I'm always interested to find books from smokers, and I like to try to guess <laughs> what it was they smoked from the from the residual aroma. <laughs> As a non-smoker, I, I I actually found myself doing that. I sniffed books. Oh yes, this was a smoker's book. I, I have no idea anything about tobacco or smoke, never having smoked at all. But it, it, it's interesting. That's always stayed with me with that story, and I still sniff books for tobacco. Mm. Do you have um, any in your collection that uh, that is smoker's books? Oh yeah, I've, I bought. I bought a, half a dozen books from a fellow I knew who was a smoker, and boy, could you tell from his books. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Conan Doyle, any pipe problem books? Uh, that would be interesting. Well, or, or even, yes, uh, it would be very nice to find a Conan Doyle book. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have, um, I, I'm always interested to find at least one book owned by. Uh, various authors and uh, and and it's nice if you can find a some sort of vestige of themselves they've left on it. Usually mm -hmm. it's a book plate or sometimes it's an inscription. But I think the smells a really evocative thing if 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 you can identify it. Uh, the the marginalia in books is a wonderful thing, isn't it? We uh, we had the conference, the Bibliographical Society in Brisbane uh, um, in 2018 on that topic of marginalia, and that is a tremendously beautiful thing where you've got those traces from the past. Uh, mm -hmm. Past in the books. I was just to, um, wanted to ask you something. Um, I've mentioned Shakespeare's first folio a couple of times, um, and I think of the beautiful quote uh, from The Tempest, in which Prospero says, Knowing I loved my books, he furnished me from my own library with volumes that I prize above my dukedom. You've uh, been collecting 50 plus years, uh, nearly 15,000 volumes, buying 500 books a year, man up to my own heart. You've spoken about uh, the that one book that was very precious to you. What does your overall library mean to you? Uh, well, it's 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 always been part of me. I started collecting when I was twenty one, when I arrived at Oxford as a graduate student, um, and I'd always been a reader. I'd always had books, and my grandmother, who taught me to read, had always told 
always sent me books for Christmas and birthday as presents and always told me, now you look after them. And that, that I still hear her saying that. And I think that's what started me having a sense of care about books, which then morphed when I was at Oxford into, collecting, into starting to be a serious collector. And I started by going to the Oxfam shop, which in Oxford in those days was the original Oxfam shop in the, in the broad, started, founded in 1948, I think. And... Uh, in those days, it was the Oxfam bookshop as well. Nowadays, the Oxfam has so many books in Oxford, it bought another shop around the corner and has an Oxfam bookshop as well as the regular Oxfam shop. But in my day, in the in the 90, early 1970s, you could wander in there and find all sorts of gems. And it, it some of them that I, I bought then were ones which were redolent of Oxford. And so it started as a way of the book signed by quite famous people from around Oxford. So, I, for instance, I, I picked up one of uh, AJP Taylor's own books with his signature in it. I picked up um, Morris, uh, one of Morris Ashley, another famous Oxford historian's books with his signature in it. I picked up books about Oxford. I put, and I actually found some with marginalia where people were disagreeing with what the author was saying <laughs> about Oxford. So I, that became a, my first real little focus about what I was collecting. I was collecting about the place that I found myself in that was very fascinating, that I'd known nothing about when I first went there. And it was a way of beginning to engage with Oxford. Um, but I also collected things that I liked to read. And I started collecting Kipling there as well. It turns out that that 1970s was probably a low point in the popularity of Kipling. Uh, and so you could pick up first editions for almost nothing. It was quite mm. extraordinary. Um, and so I, I, that also taught me to try to collect things which I like, particularly if and when they're, they're not in favour with the general public anymore, because you can do very, very well mm. out of that. And a, a mass of quite wonderful collections of things uh, that people are ignoring and that might, might otherwise disappear. And I think that's a shame. I even managed to find in Oxford... A, a couple of the very rare um, original Indian railway paperback um, Kiplings, which now fetch fabulous sums, mm. but were also being given away back in the early 1970s. So mm. it, it was it was it was a, a series of strange things. I also, as it happened, had a workmate who was a children's book collector, and I joined a little. And so he got me into collecting children's books, which I've done all of my collecting life. And I joined a little book collecting club in Oxford, and one of the members was a lovely woman called Gillian Avery, who I didn't know until about three or four months after I'd met her, was actually a very well-known author of children's books and became an expert on English children's books, has written two perhaps of the best textbooks on English children's books. And she became a friend. And so she nudged me in the direction of collecting children's books. Uh, and it was very interesting talking to a, a current author of current children's literature, particularly since she was writing about Oxford in the 1880s at that point in her children's books. Mm -hmm. And so it also resonated with my interest in, well, what was Oxford like in the 1880s? How do you do your research about this? So it was interesting seeing those different threads come together when I look back at them. I was uh, reading to my son last night from E. Nesbitt. Uh, oh, the one of my favourites. <laughs> so I remember the copy paperback copy I had years ago when I was younger. So it's lovely to revisit those stories. Just thinking also about um, uh, marginalia. When I was at the Beinecke Library, I saw a, on display a Psalter of Henry VIII's, and it just had written that this book is mine, Henry. And I remember reading, looking at, thinking, how extraordinary that uh, this object is here, and I'm looking at it. Henry VIII actually wrote that um, wrote that uh, comment. Um, do you have do you have examples, Donna, maybe of marginalia that you've seen in books that are, that uh, struck you in collection? Well, uh, I, you go first, Dawn. <laughs> <laughs> I think um, uh, my first experience of um, dealing with a lot of marginalia was when um, we acquired um, Billy Jones collection after he passed away. He was a, a local poet um, based in southeast Queensland and he had the habit of writing um, uh, across and marking his books 
terribly <laughs> and in, in some ways you know some collectors would be completely put off by the way that he marked his books but together they were extraordinary because they really showed his engagement with all of the texts and the way he was engaging and he was often writing um what another um uh, colleague of mine Nicholas Pounder called parallel texts in the books that he was reading and I, I just felt, often in um, felt pen that would bleed through the page, you know, something that you normally we would avoid um, investing in. But um, it, it was a fascinating collection and I was able to talk about that at the, the Bizans conference in 2018. But the other thing that I find myself really drawn to are books that have interesting signatures or inscriptions and I've had the really lovely experience three times now of books going back into families of origin because of the research I've done on the on the on the traces that are left in the books by other people. Um, uh, the history of Taranaki by Benjamin Wells went back to a descendant of his because of the research I'd done on all of the names that had been inscribed on the title page. The last of which I couldn't find the connection. But the, uh, the, the nephew of the last name got in touch with me and was able to provide the connection between the previous names and that last name, his uncle. And um, he was actually a, a descendant of Benjamin Wells and he bought the book. And it's, it's, that's happened um, more than once for me. And I, I just love that. Well, we'll just have one more first folio comment and then we'll get on to other marginalia. But that's that whole beautiful thing. You open the first folio at a particular page and there is a her book, um, Elizabeth Winderbank, and she's actually written it in the first folio. But, um, yes, the inscriptions and things are really interesting. And talking about, you know, royalty, um, I've always been fascinated with the Bible. Now, you know, we all have old Bibles in the collection, but I think this is a, um, oh, I can't remember what edition it is exactly. It's a 17th century Bible. But in it, it actually has this inscription that says, this book was in the study of Charles I and was regularly used by him. And then there's another little inscription on another page which attests to that as well. Mm -hmm. And look, it may or may not be true. Look, he might have had half a dozen Bibles he read every day. But even if he's just looked at this once and it's got his inscription in it, that's an amazing thing around that Bible. And I'm I'm trying to track down at the moment. We have um, um, uh, another book which actually says that it was owned by Charles II. I mean, uh, this regalty thing isn't normally there, but anyway, owned by Charles II. And I can't quite believe it. So I'm trying to find out where we bought, bought it and who bought it and when we bought it, just to see if I can track it back. But you can go down rabbit holes with inscriptions and marginalia and never come out. <laughs> we, have a, we have a couple of interesting examples in the Prior Library of Marginalia. One is a book from the 1500s, Dialogues of Creatures Moralized, which is like an Aesop's mm -hmm. fable uh, style story uh, with woodcut illustrations. But it had been owned by Gabriel Harvey, who was a contemporary of Edmund Spencer and mm. was well known for marking up and writing in his books. Yes. So lots of wonderful things there. And in fact, um, uh, Philip and Mag's brothers in London was in touch about our copy, saying even though the copy isn't the most complete copy, it's missing a couple of um, pages, it's probably the most interesting copy in the world. And we think, wow, that's, that's great that <laughs> this copy in the Friar Library in Brisbane is maybe the most interesting copy of that book. But the other wonderful example is uh, in Hawksworth's three-volume quarto set, the official account of Cook's Voyages, we have a few sets of that, but uh, one first edition set had belonged to a fellow named um, Humphrey Edwards, who was the ship's surgeon on Commodore John Byron's circumnavigation, and volume one of Hawksworth deals with those preceding voyages. And he's marked up uh, and lots of fascinating uh, comments. And one piece of, one commentary was where he was talking about meeting with uh, Byron later when he was an admiral, was the Philip Carteret voyage where Carteret approaches the admiral and says, look, this ship is not seaworthy for me to sail around the world in. And we just couldn't make out the comment that he's talking about having breakfast with Carteret and with um, Admiral Byron. And Byron, when, when Carteret leaves the room, says something that we very annoyingly cannot work right. out. I've had Des Cowley and other people trying to work out the word. Um, as he leaves, he says, he shall be a something sacrifice. 
Sort of sacrifice. So paleography is another whole field. <laughs> we've got a we've got a fantastic collection of manuscript charts uh, by Philip Carter. Eh? Lots of writing on them. Maybe that can help you. That's wonderful. Um, just uh, thinking ahead to our conference, which I hope everyone uh, will be able to come to at the National Library in Canberra on the fourth and fifth of December, with the Rare Book Librarians Day on the sixth to follow. Um, that topic of theme of the conference is on bibliomania, and I'm sure that uh, a lot of us here are bibliomaniacs, and I'm sure you've come across some uh, very interesting collectors uh, over over the course of your uh, lives as booksellers and uh, book collectors, private and institutional. Um, are there any interesting examples of obsessive book collectors that you can think of, leaving aside Chris? Um, uh, we've got a. Oh, sorry, Chris, you go first. Go ahead. Go ahead. I was just going to say, we have this fantastic collection, the Ben Hunneman Cervantes collection. He spent 70 years. You might have known Ben, I did, Chris. I did know Ben, He yeah. spent 30 years um, acquiring copies, editions of Don Quixote, and children's books, illustrated editions, um, amazing collection of, and he was obsessed with how important uh, that novel was, and um, that's fantastic, yeah. He's got a fantastic collection. Yeah, yeah, I've known a few people who become obsessed with a single title, single yes. book, and mm. spend their life collecting that. And that. I'm a collector of um, Alice, uh, amongst other things, but I know people who collect only Alice in Wonderland. I know somebody <laughs> else actually who collects only Through the Looking Glass. Mm. Uh, uh, so single, single title collectors. That's that's a little unusual because I, I find that no matter how narrow I try to start some aspect of collecting. It, it it goes off into broader directions, but I, I I just want to come back to the notion of a obsessive collector. One of the people I shared a, a house with my first year at Oxford was an obsessive collector. He was doing a um, a, a thesis on uh, May Gray, the, uh, the the Simenon books, uh, and he was comparing a couple of English translations with the French originals, uh, trying to discover if their popularity in in England was because of something that might have been changed during the translation or was it reflecting something that was inherent in the books. And so he was an obsessive buyer of, of Maigret uh, and he had a wonderful collection of both English and French uh, first editions and then every English translation that he could find. And back then, in the, uh, Simon was still alive and still writing, and there were the, but people were... St still producing new translations of the new works. And he I remember him telling me that three or four might come out within two years of the French uh, version coming out. And I, I lost touch with this fellow. I won't, I won't name him. I lost touch with him. And then about three years later, I met a mutual friend. I said, oh, do you ever find so-and-so? Do you know what happened to him? I said, oh, yes, it was very sad. He said his, his, his marriage broke down. I said, oh, what, what was that? He said, well, it was his obsessive book collecting. Because they, were, he and his wife were travelling in Germany together, and they were standing on a station waiting for the train, and they had uh, about the price of a cup of coffee or two cups of coffee left, the only money they had together. But he spotted a German edition of Maigret at the bookstore, bought it. And she never spoke to him again, basically, <laughs> and it was the divorce. So <laughs> book collecting can be a difficult thing for relationships. That's that's the. Christmas example I have of it. Any obsessive uh, book collectors in Brisbane, Dawn, that you can... <laughs> um, there, uh, well, I recently met a book collector. We, I meet a lot of people in, in our shop who aren't actually based in Brisbane. Um, a lot of travellers come through, and I, I recently met a collector of Somerset Maugham who was inspired by Maugham as a reader and then proceeded to collect and has amassed an incredible collection. But he's gone down a particular rabbit hole where he's now looking for books about um, ambulance drivers in World War I because apparently Somerset Maugham was an ambulance driver yes. during World War I. And so he's looking for books about that topic as a sort of a sub sort of rabbit hole or a, a branch off the warren that he's he's now kind of you know involved in in pursuing but you know he has Morm's um, last will and testament he has a you know a handwritten manuscript for one of his stories he's yeah he's really it's uh it's it's a very uh, focused and and well-loved collection I think why they start to collect these books is interesting we've got 
the Richardson collection here, and he was an Englishman, and he started to collect Bibles because his wife thought that she was related to John Rogers, who's one of the first martyrs in Mary's reign. You know, he printed the English Bible. And so the entire collection was based on that belief, which, you know, what genealogy is like. It may not even have been true. <laughs> Endless <laughs> pursuit. <laughs> so thinking about bibliomania and this idea that the, you know, this mad obsession with collecting books, but usually there's a there is a method to the madness, right? So collectors who are very focused at want, as we say, particular editions, particular volumes, particular titles. And um, I have a wonderful friend here in Brisbane who collects in different areas to do with exploration, a wonderful collection on James Cook's um, voyages, and probably, I would say, now one of the, the most important collections on that topic in Australia. And while I was uh, there one day, he showed me a copy of um, Barnier Kropelin's the catalogue of Brownie, um, Brownie Kropelin's uh, Bibliotheca Polynesia. So this is the great Norwegian collector whose collection on Polynesia ended up at the Oslo um, in, uh, State Library. And in the introduction, Rolf de Ritz writes, any kind of serious book collecting on the grand scale that does not in the end directly or indirectly serve the ends of bibliography and of textual criticism is, in my opinion, irresponsible and meaningless. The real greatness of collections such as the Propolin Library lies in their bibliographical significance and their importance to scholarship. So I just want to touch on uh, this importance of these private collectors and private collections. Uh, because if you think about the great private collections over the years, think so, so Sir Joseph um, Banks's library and herbarium in Soho, his apartment in London, which he invited others to come in and use. Um, they are really important reference libraries too, right? Besides the, the state library, national libraries, there's a comment on that, that notion. Yes, I, I think that the collectors that collect uh, assiduously and selectively in a particular topic area end up developing such an incredible depth and breadth of knowledge in that area that they're able to put together uh, a much a different sort of reference collection to that that will be acquired in an institutional library, because the driving force, I think, is slightly different. Uh, and so they often represent that that is a totality of books on that particular topic, represent a different perspective on that topic than what you will often see in an institutional library. So I think there's a great value in, in those types of collections. And the second point to say is that many of the people who put these collections together, uh, and I include myself in, in this in, in a minor way, write about what they collect. And so you're using your own collection as your own reference collection, but you're trying to spread the information you've gleaned through it out there into the Biblioverse. And I think that that's an understated and underrecognized function uh, that comes out of book collecting by the private collector. Can I can I talk about an um a private collector who started collecting um in it? I liked your question, Maggie, about why these people start collecting. She started collecting because she had a disagreement with the university lecturer when she was quite a young woman about the role of um the sort of work women had been doing throughout history and how it had been recorded. So she started with that one question and then amassed over forty five years nearly 9,000 volumes um, uh, to answer that question, which was her own question. Well, how, what did, how did women work? What sort of work were they doing? I'm talking about Lisa Unger Baskin in the United States, who's a well-known collector there. And her collection recently was um, found a home at Duke University. And um, there's, I, I can pop a link actually in the chat if anyone wants to have a look at that. And I just, it's, I found that quite an inspiring story because in, to answer that question, she was collecting things, and you mentioned this earlier, Chris, things that people were ignoring um, and that might otherwise have disappeared, people that things were not necessarily valuing, things like receipts for work um, done 
by women printers, you know, in the 19th or 18th century. Uh, and her collection goes right from 1240, I think is the earliest manuscript, right through to the 20th century. I think the, the, late, the last thing was that she collected was um, Emma Goldman's papers and letters. So it's, it's, it's an extraordinary um, collection answering a question that she had, and it's now available to the public and to researchers to use as a resource. Um, yeah. I so think that I, Sir William Dixon's a collection that we have here, and he, he's you know, like a, look at, not a miniature because that doesn't give him the respect he, he requires, but he collected voyages and travel and history of Australia, et cetera. And he, but he did a lot of work on them. He wasn't just collecting. Mm. And he, you know, we have lists where he's, you know, um, listed everything in that volume or he's traced the background to it. He's transcribed manuscripts. So he spent a lot of time adding value to his collection. And then when the collection was given to us, we have all of this extra detail that mm -hmm. he added to it. So, yeah, different collectors give you a very different perspective. And sometimes you get that personality. He was just absolutely assiduous about detailed things. And we have his correspondence. We have his invoices, uh, all sorts of things. So, yeah, that's it's fantastic. I mean, book collectors keep all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Dawn, I wanted to ask you a question because um, you, you and Hamish, your your business partner and partner in life, uh, who run Archives uh, Fine Books, have started a Young Collectors Prize, Book Collectors Prize, a couple of years ago. And I wondered, uh, we could talk a little bit about why you wanted to start that prize and what uh, what we found. I was had the honour of helping to assess the applications this year. Wonderful. Um, yeah, what, what was your what was your motivation to start the Young Book Collectors Pride? Uh, my motivation was uh, basically I came into the book selling and the collecting world um, more recently than, than 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 my esteemed colleagues on the panel here today. Um, probably around twenty ten and. In 2015, I became a member of ANZAB and I started attending fairs and I noticed that I was um, one of the youngest members of ANZAB and I'm not that young. <laughs> and I also noticed that the people coming to the fairs were of a certain you know, age demographic and I, I started asking myself the question, are young people collecting? What are they collecting? Where are young people if they are collecting? We certainly had a lot of young people in our shop buying books, but I wasn't necessarily getting a sense. It was from some of them I was getting a sense that they might be collecting or, you know, nascent collectors. Um, and so that I suppose I had that suite of questions um, from that those early experiences, and then I became uh, inspired by another bookseller in the United States um, who launched a book collecting prize for young women. And I it occurred to me, because book collecting prizes um, generally are in the US and the UK and elsewhere are run by institutions or associations. And it had never occurred to me that a bookstore could run a book collecting prize. So then I, I but I was inspired by the, these um friends and colleagues in the US and went, oh, goodness, maybe that's actually a way to, to answer some of the questions that I have about where are the young collectors and what are they collecting. So um, so I, I had a chat to a few members of ANZAB. wasn't really something for, for our association to take on as, as an initiative, but as a private bookseller, I was, I was encouraged, actually, by some, um, or certainly not discouraged. And so I went ahead, uh, Hamish and I went ahead and established the prize in 2019. And um, yes, and then this year, so we it's an occasional prize at the moment that we had a winner in, tw in 2020 and then we ran it again. Uh, in Well, we tried to run it again in 2022, but the pandemic was very disruptive um, and that didn't result in anything, unfortunately. But then last year we ran it again and uh, Simon was... Uh, on the judging panel, as was uh, Jörn Harbeck, another friend and colleague here in Brisbane. And, yeah, we had a terrific uh, response this year. Uh, we went national uh, and we had mostly, we had six um, applicants from Queensland, one from New South Wales, one from South Australia, and a young man now, resi now residing in Melbourne, in fact, uh, Nadim Tudayan, who's a young uh, physician, um, 
trainee physician won the prize. So yeah, it, it, he's he was a great he his his was a great application, and uh, he spoke really really fantastically about it during Melbourne Rare Book Week last week. Well, it's very dis- deserving winner, but there were some other fascinating entries. One was about somebody who collected martial arts books. It really touched me because I I did karate for a long while and. Uh, just last week, I had the news that my karate instructor had passed away as a Japanese instructor at a very early age. And I remembered why that really struck me, because, you know, when you're doing a, an art form like karate, you have these books about something you're so physically passionate about. I, I really, that one spoke to me. I'm just conscious of the time. And uh, I did have one last thing before we go to the questions, because I know there are 21 questions there. We'll <laughs> get to a few of them. But that even others, young people, but also all people, have constraints now, right? So we, we you know, cost of living is is so high at the moment, it's very hard to secure accommodation. Renters are inevitably having to move periodically. There's not a lot of space. I remember when I um, first met uh, my wife in 2009, I was living in Tulbrick, uh, and which is an apartment, one of the oldest apartments in Brisbane, and it was just a one-bedroom apartment. And I had books stuffed in the kitchen and cupboards and everywhere. And she said, you, you've you got to be realistic. So <laughs> for the first time in my life, I sold books. It was Hamish uh, who came to my place and he said, right, get out of the books. So I put, he said, right, I'm just going to move them from one side of the room to the other, the ones that I want. So he just went through the process of moving the whole pile from one side to the other, took them all. <laughs> and my wife was delighted. Uh, but now... You know, we live in a small townhouse still. I still have that little set of books that I love, including um, my Gabriel Garcia Marquez. They're not valuable, there's paperbacks for different types. My wife's Colombian, so she approves of that choice. <laughs> but my wife is correct, right? We have to be realistic and um, we can't uh, we can't take everything we want. Uh, we're not all in that position. Yeah, it's... it's- can I say it? it's um it's difficult, isn't it? Uh, yeah, I've been encouraged. I, like like Dawn, I've been concerned where the next generation of book collectors is coming from, what they'll be collecting, how they'll be able to manage it. As you you've alluded to, when struggling to just eat and put a roof over your head, consume so much of one's income. Uh, and so I, I'm fortunate that I'm not in that situation. I'm fortunate at the time of life where uh, I, I'm. So I was quite surprised myself that because I thought I was going to be back to collecting penguins at this stage of life because I wouldn't be able to afford to do anything else. But in fact, it's not turned out that way for a number of reasons. So I I do actively try to help young people um, uh, where I can. And I've uh, and advised them into entries into book collecting, which is possible for them, and to and to think about what they want to actually keep and what they want to experience having perhaps for a short while and then possibly move on. So that they, then gives them the cash turnover to acquire something else they might want to keep for a little while and move on. So it seems to me that that's one entree into book collecting when you are constrained by budget and also by accommodation. And it resonated with me because I, I faced a similar difficulty because being an academic, I had to move to different universities to build my career. That involved coming from England to Australia to Canada back to Australia. Uh, now, mm-hmm. I I was wise in a couple of those moves. I left a whole bunch of books with my mother in England and eventually got them sent out to Australia where I can afford it. And I similarly uh, left a whole lot of books I'd acquired in my first time in Australia with my wife's parents and then reunited with those when we came back again. So I was fortunate to be able to actually store um books let's say in spaces that weren't my own living space that was actually very fortunate on on reflection um because i had had uh, earlier uh lost some books which i had bought when i was very young because my brother took them and he decided mm-hmm. they'd become his books but then he sold them without telling me uh so that kind of resonated with me i, I i've forgiven him long since for doing that but it made me wary about what's the security of books that I actually love a lot. And there were, there were a couple of, of first edition Kiplings in those ones he sold, which I was able to replace, but that was fine. But it, it, it actually made me think about what am I doing? What, how do I make sure that I can keep what I want to keep? So that's a big, big problem for, for young people who are still in their early mobility, shall I say, of life. Yeah. 
I think the other thing that's also coming up is, and we touched on this before we started to speak today, is that um, it's not just the young, it's the, we have a couple of collectors who need to move into nursing homes and different accommodation. Yeah. And they have their life's collection there and they don't want to see it disappear and they may not have a family who are interested in it. Mm. And you really need to have a plan. Yeah. And big in libraries can't take everything, but it really, can I just give you a clue? If you've got a list, it helps us. Otherwise, it's just a mystery in a box. Yeah, mm. absolutely. Absolutely. One of my bits of advice to all collectors, so they come to my advice for things, is keep a database. Yes. Mm. Uh, that's the best possible thing you do. And and keep pictures of, of, of your books as well. Mm. They're the two most important records that you can keep. Yeah. Now, listen, I've been a, I've been a terrible timekeeper, so we've got lots of questions uh, in the chat. And I will ask at least one. Uh, Chris uh, Tiffin, uh, what factors determine whether a large public library keeps a recently acquired collection discreet and largely intact, rather than just absorbing the unheld items in their existing collections, which we touched on before about cherry picking? Uh, is there value in sometimes setting aside the normal, normal calculus of storage economy, that is taking on taking a whole collection? It is a case by case basis. And um, it really does depend on the collection and why it was collected, how comprehensive it is. And so we have kept collections together when they have an absolute, absolute raison d'etre. They are absolutely together and they, um, and we have done that. But quite often it's a sort of a fairly sort of mixed collection. You know, there's first editions, there's bits and pieces. And in those cases, you know, quite often we'll just cherry pick, uh, but we'll always put into the record where it comes from. So they may not be known as the, you know, Hahnemann Cervantes collection, but we can also always gather together the books that were put together by a particular collector. Is that an okay answer? It's great. Yeah. No, I mean, we, we're, all, we're often offered uh, here uh, deceased estates and mm -hmm. uh, it's very hard, especially state libraries will have to choose because they already have lots of mm. things they can't take the whole thing um but it's wonderful we, I, I guess our instinct is to preserve and collect as much as we can uh where we can't the uq the university of queensland has an alumni book fair every year so we do urge people to think of that option as well um i just read a couple more so are papers from the marginalia symposium available many of those papers were published in script and print our journal um my own paper was published a book called Captain Cook in Queensland by the Royal Historical Society of Queensland. Um, any other? I saw something flash up um, Sorry. Sorry, Maggie, I was going to say, um, we had a few people interested in uh, resources for getting the terminology of book appraisal and or book binding. Uh, so what would each of you recommend to wrap your head around that terminology? Well, the ABC book, what is it? The ABC oh, John book. Carter's ABC for yes. Just, yeah. <laughs> yes. It, yeah. And it's available online as well, ABC of Book Collectors. Yeah, it's it's a classic and yeah. uh, very but, useful. Every book collector should have one on their shelves, even though it is available online. Mm. Or <laughs> in my case, is. two. <laughs> This has been a wonderful discussion, uh, Maggie, Dawn and Chris. Thank you so much for joining me today. It's one of those topics that's hard to compress into one hour. I know there are other questions there. Thank you, everyone, for posing those uh, questions to us. Thank you so much for the conversation, uh, Chris, Dawn and Maggie. It's been a real, a real pleasure. I look forward to seeing everyone at the Bibliographical Society Conference at the National Library in Canberra. Uh, 4th and 5th of December. Our uh, colleague Susanna Hellman is uh, putting together a wonderful, uh, wonderful conference there, which will be both virtual and uh, in person. Uh, and I think I'll hand over to Marie now for closing comments. Thank you so much, everybody, for joining us today. That was absolutely fantastic and such an interesting and engaging conversation. And I agree with Simon, we could have probably gone on for at least another hour. 
Um, but there's a few topics there that I think we'll be able to take on board for uh, future conversations as well. Um, so yes, as Simon said, um, keep in mind that um, BZN's conference is coming up later this year, so do check out our website for more information on that. Um, if you're interested in contributing ideas for future webinars or to our occasional newsletter broadsheet, um, you can contact the engagement committee at bzansengagement at gmail.com. We'll pop that in the chat. Uh, and you can also reach out to us on social media through Facebook and LinkedIn. And uh, there were links to those in the chat as well. And lastly, if you're not already a member of the society, please consider joining us. Um, you can find more information on the website as well. So thank you very much, everybody. It's been an absolute pleasure and we hope to see you all next time.